Can the United States expect to see expanding political violence at home? Sebastian Gorka, an international security and terrorism expert, believes so. He'll explain why next on Global Perspectives. This is Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia. Welcome to Global Perspectives. What is the terrorism threat to the United States today? Sebastian Gorka, a chaired professor at Marine Corps University, has insight on both the dangers and opportunities. Welcome to the show, Dr. Gorka. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Tell us just in brief what the terrorism threat today is for the United States, both internationally and at home. I think the best description for the threat to the United States today is to describe it as one of a global jihadist movement. That really includes anybody, whether it's the original Al-Qaeda that executed the 9-11 attacks, or whether it's the group ISIS or the Islamic State today that controls large swaths of Iraq and Syria. Any of those groups that have the ideology, that share the ideology of a fundamentalist interpretation of Islam that should create a caliphate or a theocratic empire once more, that's the threat. And it has very uh, various different uh, permutations. It is the groups in the Middle East. It is the groups in Africa, such as Boko Haram. It is also the terrorists that are taking the fight to the infidel, as they see it, on US soil. So we had the shooting in Chattanooga. We've had the Boston bombers, the Tsarnaev brothers. We've had the Fort Hood shooting. We've had numerous cases of actually what we call the conus threat, when the jihadist ideology Theology finds a root in people here in America and they wish to uh, shoot their fellow Americans, their servicemen, or to attack innocent civilians. Tell us how this develops. We hear about the so-called lone wolf and, and we worry about the radicalizing of individuals isolated at home in their basements in front of their computers. Are they all that isolated or is there something more connected about this than we generally know? I, I try not to encourage the use of the word or the phrase lone wolf. This, this lone part of, of, of the phrase seems to minimize uh, this uh, phenomena, to make us think that this is the anomaly. Um, there is never, and there never has been, a significant plot or attack in which the individual or individuals were disconnected from the broader movement. Whether it was Richard Reed 14 years ago, you remember the shoe bomber. He traveled in the Middle East. He was picked up by so-called talent spotters, handlers, people who indoctrinated him further, provided him training. Um, whether it was the Tsarnaev brothers, we know the elder brother traveled back to the Caucasus region and probably met with Chechen or Dagestani extremists. Or even if we look at the Fort Hood shooter, Major Nidal Hassan, on the internet, he was in regular contact with Anwar al-Awlaki, one of the most important al-Qaeda leaders uh, in Yemen. So um, there are people who aren't part of a large organization like Al-Qaeda or ISIS, but they share the ideology of global jihadism. And I think that's really the, the center of gravity, if you will. If you want to understand the threat, if you want to predict what will happen next, the strategy of the bad guys, if you will, you need to read their documents. They have internet magazines. They have Inspire for Al-Qaeda. They have the ISIS magazine, Dabiq. These are English language jihadi ideology uh, products that are used to propagate the message of holy war and are used to provide a tradecraft to the p potential terrorists. What is it about these outreach efforts that people find appealing? There's a lot of debate about this. Yeah, well, again, I, I think we have to start with, with jettison, jettisoning the, the, the urban legends. It's, it's not a question of poverty or lack of education, this idea that there are local grievances that lead to terrorism. If it were poverty and lack of education that led directly to terrorism, then half of the Indian subcontinent would be terrorists, and they're not. So what is it? Um, if we look at the 19 hijackers of 9-11, if we look at Jihadi John, the, the 
the, the front man of ISIS, if you will. These are graduate students. These are middle class, often with advanced degrees and, and good jobs. So, so what's missing? It's the ideology and it's the search for meaning. It is the idea that in a, in a world um, brought into confusion by multiculturalism or, or moral relativism, that young man is, is looking for a purpose. And along comes somebody, a radical imam or a recruiter for al-Qaeda or ISIS who says, I'll give you purpose. How about being a holy warrior? How about fighting for God? And, and that can be very seductive to a man who's lost purpose in his life and he bit, buys into the ideology of being a, a jihadi. And, and what are the opportunities for someone who does buy into this? Are they necessarily what the person thinks he's getting? <laughs> well, we have some very interesting reports now of people who have been recruited and who have um, found that the reality on the ground is not exactly uh, what ISIS portrayed or Al-Qaeda portrayed. We also have some very interesting um, noises of resistance, if you will, from the parents of people who have become jihadis. Um, and here the, the, the very um, the fascinating point is, are you really fighting for Islam? Is Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi the head of ISIS? Does he have some special credentialing to declare himself the caliph of a new empire? This, this is where the narrative breaks down. And this is where we have opportunities in any ideological war whether it's against Nazis in World War II or the Soviet Union during the Cold War, it should be our goal to identify the gap, the delta, between what the ideologues portray as the truth and what the truth, truth is on the ground. For communists, it was creating that perfect paradise of equality. Well, we know now that there was very little equality behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, today, we have the same uh, challenge. Can we identify the, 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 the mismatch, the disjuncture between what the bad guys say about their vision of the world and what's happening on the ground. If there is a large gap, we have to target it and we have to do information operations to, il to, il to illuminate the, the truth of what this ideology brings to the average person. What are we doing and is it effective or ineffective? Well, unfortunately, it really isn't effective. And we've had 14 years to get it right. But at the strategic communications or the information operations in that domain, we, we've really stuck to a very tactical response to the enemy. We have US Army units. We have Marine Corps units that are specialized in information operations in what we used to call psychological warfare. But they're not being driven at a strategic level by the White House or by national policy. Um, it's very much done in theater at a very low level. What should be done is, of course, just as we did during World War II or during the Cold War, is to delegitimize the argument of the enemy, to make this idea of jihadism unpopular, and to question the legitimacy of those people who preach it. Uh, one of the easiest ways would be, of course, to focus on the religious aspect. We, we have a culture in, in, in Washington that wishes not to discuss the religious aspects of this war. But it would be very powerful, for instance, to say, OK, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, you say you are fighting for Islam. You say you are the best Muslims. But who are the majority of your victims? In fact, in many parts of Iraq and Syria, it's not even the Shia, not even those that are deemed to be heretics by ISIS. It is, in fact, Sunni Muslims. So they are killing their own in the name of their religion. That would be a very powerful weapon if we could uh, shed a light on the reality or the inconsistencies of their message and thus denude them of the popularity that allows them to recruit more jihadists. How would you develop an accurate way of accounting for just how many casualties? there are? Uh, well, there are various um, NGOs, foundations. There is the, uh, a British-based one that focuses on the fatalities in Syria. There are various ones that are associated with the Assyrian church, with the Kurds. And they have sources in theater that are constantly monitoring and reporting on the internet the latest atrocities, the latest attacks. So usually it is the NGO sector that has, has the freshest figures that are publicly available. So how do we go about, you said we have to understand the religious aspects and that is something that at least at the national level in this country there's been an effort to keep them separated and we also have to understand what it is that is so alluring 
about this ideology. Can you help us with that question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Again, I, I think it goes back to where we've arrived at in, in the last 40 years of, of Western politics. We've had a, a, a deconstruction of the nation state or the identity uh, within the nation state. We've had an emphasis on uh, multiculturalism, on postmodernism, and as a result, we end up um, with, with young men and sometimes young women who are, are distraught of purpose. I think the 7-7 bombers in London are a fascinating case study. You have the son of young Bangl of Bangladeshi immigrants who came to the UK to integrate. They were Muslims, but they wanted to be British. Um, and and they, want, they saw that Britain was a good thing to be a part of. Their, their, their child sees their integration as something negative because he doesn't understand why would you want to be part of a system that suddenly says it's not good. Uh, Britain became a dirty word in the 1990s, associated with colonialism, associated with negative aspects of, of Western history. As a result, he's confused. His parents wanted to be British. The new political elite tell him British is, 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 is bad. So who am I? What am I? Am I Muslim? Am I British? Am I Bangladeshi? There's a confusion. In that confusion, you are provided potentially an answer. Along comes a radical, along comes a recruiter who says, you know, there is two parts to this world. There is the infidel and there is the believer. You can save your soul, you can die in a war, but you will die in a war in a way that brings you personal salvation and meaning. That's very powerful. That's a message that, that we've seen ISIS in nine months recruit 19,000 foreign fighters. Those are figures that Al-Qaeda never, ever came close to achieving. ISIS has made them a reality because of the social media exploitation and their understanding of the internet. So how can we possibly fight back against something that's so attractive? Well, number one, we do what I've already intimated, which is focus on the, the inconsistencies of the message. We have a role, whether we're Muslims or not, we can say, hang on, what you're saying is not what you're doing, you're killing Muslims. Um, but primarily, the main actor in this war will, of course, be our Muslim allies. The Sunnis of the region especially, such as President Sisi, such as King Abdullah II of Jordan, those people who want to be Western who want to be the allies of the United States and who have said themselves that the jihadists want to kill us. I think it's fascinating that on New Year's Day, President Sisi, the uh, premier of the largest Arab nation in the world, went to the equivalent of the Vatican, the Al-Azhar in Cairo, and told the gathered theologians, gentlemen, you must assist me in taking down the jihadis with a religious revolution in Islam. Uh, that's exactly what we need. We, saw, we need somebody who has democratic credentials, who's been elected, to say, look, even if you think it was right to kill the infidel in the seventh century, this is the 21st century. We don't do that anymore, and we want to be friends with the US, the UK, whoever it is. We need to support reformers, not just at the highest level of government, but also the very brave Muslims today that at the grassroots are trying to uh, bring democracy and Islam to some kind of compatibility. And this is what the United States should be supporting as well. Yes, as, as we did during the Cold War. I mean, John, you remember well, uh, we spent billions of dollars behind the Iron Curtain, whether it was it with Solidarność, the Solidarity Movement in Poland, whether it was the, um, the dissidents all over the captive nations, to help them from the inside to undermine the legitimacy of the communist ideology in the Kremlin. Uh, we don't do that today. And uh, if we don't do that, if we don't support the reformists, uh, your children, my grandchildren, they'll be fighting this war and it will be a war of whack-a-mole, as they say in Washington. It will be killing the extremists one after another without actually attacking the heart of the issue, what makes somebody want to become a jihadi. Do we have the capability to combat this but not the willingness? We had. But unfortunately, in the 1990s, as you well know, um, for political reasons, we uh, neutered ourselves. We had something called the U.S. Information Agency, and we did away with it. We thought we don't need to 
have a co cohesive, um, comprehensive communications campaign around the world with offices everywhere that, that sells the concept of freedom, liberty, and democracy. So we did away with it. There are some people still around who are part of, of that effort. They need to be brought back in government. And we might actually need an institutional home for this kind of activity in the future, because, because otherwise we will be condemned to this constant, vicious cycle of violence getting violence. If you were to project 25, 30 years into the future, would you see us as being in a similar situation? Would you see us as making progress against this challenge? Of, depends on whether you're optimistic or pessimistic <laughs> on, and, and how well we rally yeah. our, our capabilities in the areas you've been addressing. Um, I think, unfortunately, for democracies, um, they really are the 800-pound gorilla that doesn't take things seriously unless something you know, vicious happens to them. When did we take al-Qaeda seriously? On September the 12th. Um, so um, it may take a mass casualty attack on U.S. soil that is operationally linked to ISIS for us to wake up and, and really start to understand the threat and respond to it adequately. But, but it could be something else as well. I, I work very closely with our, our, our Sunni allies in the region. Um, Jordan is very fragile. Jordan is the apple of the eye of ISIS. They want to take it down. They want to attack it. Mecca and Medina, hugely important. If there's a cataclysmic event in the region, we will be dragged into it kicking and screaming. And a nuclear Iran, if you're Turkey, if you're Saudi Arabia, you're not going to wait. You're going to buy nuclear weapons from Vladimir or somebody else. As a result, there could be exogenous events, there could be external events that force us to finally take this very, very seriously. Mm. So you still haven't told me whether you're optimistic or pessimistic. You <laughs> I, may be avoiding the question. I, I, I'm, an Amer I'm a proud American now, so I have to be an optimist sooner or later. Look, we defeated the Nazis. We defeated the communists. Uh, we'll defeat this scourge as well. The trouble is I, I, I hope more uh, Americans won't have to die before we start to do it properly. It seemed that when we were dealing with the onset of modern terrorism in the 1970s, we tended to approach it with techniques, analyses, and so forth that we had used in the past. And then we continued to use that system of, of studying and analyzing with the newer age of terrorism in, in the 90s. And now we're in a, obviously in a different age again, or a different period of, of the new age of terrorism. And we, we keep relying on old practices. Is, is that inevitable, or can we change? We, we have to change, John. We really have to change. Uh, in my position in the Horner Chair, I support all the schools in the Marine Corps University in Quantico, but I, I, I also support the, uh, the Special Warfare School in Fort Bragg and, and the FBI. And, and the message I have almost everywhere, where, which, whoever the audience is, whether it's uh, military special forces, whether it's the Marines, whether it's uh, FBI agents, law enforcement, is, is the old legacy structures and the ways of analyzing really don't match the irregular warfare environment we have today. Um, for example, we, we look at the Chattanooga uh, attack. We still divide terrorism into domestic terrorism and international. The FBI has different sections for DT, they call it, and IT. Well, let me ask you, what was 9-11? Was it domestic? Well, it sure happened in Manhattan and in D.C. and in Pennsylvania. But where had those guys come from and where was their mastermind? Well, he was in Afghanistan. So which is it? It's both. It's both. But what was the original rationale for having that division between the two? The, the idea that you can separate. It's, it's, you know, academically, it's the Westphalian approach. that We can separate domestic actors that, 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 that are completely different in nature, whether it's you know, a Timothy McVeigh is, is, is different from Al Qaeda. Well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe the fact that they're both using violence to attempt to change a system and inculcate fear into a population that's what's key. So, you know, these divisions between internal and external, I think, no longer hold. And, and perhaps more pernicious is our national security architecture still divides the world into um, regions, organizations, and individuals. So if you're a member of the in intelligence community, you may be the desk officer for Yemen. 
because we divide regionally. You may be the intelligence officer for ISIS or Al-Qaeda, and then a third person will be the targeter for Abu Bakr or for Zawahiri, the head of Al-Qaeda. This is a very prosaic and functional idea of how the world works. But, but really, it's not about individuals or organizations. It's about ideology. What connects a Boko Haram in Nigeria to an al-Nusra front or an al-Qaeda in Libya? It's their shared ideology. So I think we are still struggling with legacy constructs and concepts that, that we have to realize may have been OK for facing the Soviet Union or the IRA or ETA or the weathermen. But in today's completely amorphous, globalized international system, um, we have to rethink where the centers of gravity for each of these threats really lies. Talk to us about the terrorism threat in the broader context of an evolving 21st century world where we're suddenly seeing uh, the resurgence of conflict and, yes. and problems in places where we thought these issues were settled. <laughs> Um, let me take it a little bit broader than just terrorism per se, uh, and let me talk about what we call irregular threats, whether it's narco cartels, or, or whether it's terrorists, or whether it's human traffickers, or whether it's nation states that are using unconventional means. The, the ironic reality today is that America is the most powerful nation the world has ever seen. 11 aircraft carriers, more special forces than most countries actually have soldiers. As a result, everybody we may face as a threat, whether it's China, Russia, or ISIS, is going to prefer to use unconventional and irregular means. Whether you're China with your cyber hackers, North Korea taking down Sony, or whether you're Vladimir Putin deploying those little green men in Crimea, these are all asymmetric, unconventional means of attack. We, we need to understand that's, that's war. War isn't saving Private Ryan. It really isn't massed battle groups of tanks. That's the anomaly. If you look at the history of war, um, less than 20% of all conflict since Napoleon was conventional. As a result, we have to reassess what conflict means when China controls most of the uh, rare earth minerals in Africa. That is a strategic loss to America. If you like the contents of your iPad, if they're coming from Chinese factories, that can be switched off at the source. So I think we need to have a, a more comprehensive and unconventional understanding of how conflicts evolve and what makes a threat and, and get beyond the idea that the, the, the conventional threat the massed tanks, the ICBMs, that's the biggest danger. It may not be. It may be refugee floods. It may be economic warfare. It may be political warfare. We need to reanalyze the essence of conflict. And you touched on the nuclear piece earlier in our conversation. Are we winning the battle in terms of the proliferation issue? It seems like we've got more nations than ever with nuclear weapons, a frighteningly long list of nations that have of uranium that's essentially bomb ready and others who are trying to either make or, or acquire these weapons. What, what do we do? Um, in every case, of course, it has to be uh, analyzed based upon the two components of any threat analysis, which is capability, but also intent or will to do us harm. Uh, we have no problem that Israel has nuclear capability or that France has nuclear capability, but when Iran is facilitated to arrive at a place where it could get nuclear capability. Um, and on Fridays in the mosques, you have government-sponsored uh, people saying, America must be destroyed, it's the great Satan. That's where I start to get concerned, where, where you have nations that fear for their own security. If Iran goes nuclear, what are you going to do? as a Turkey, as a Saudi Arabia. The, these are the issues that I don't think we've analyzed deeply enough, that the arms race, in a region of the world where apocalyptic ideas are actually very, very well established could lead to nightmare scenarios that would make Cuba in 1962 look like a small incident. So John, I have no magic answer, uh, but the trend is not going in the right direction. Great, well thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Gorka. It's a pleasure, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for Global Perspectives. I'm John Bercia, and we'll see you next time.